Hello ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is Dr. Cheek and welcome to our second lecture for week 10 on the bureaucracy and the judiciary in a comparative setting. Our first lecture we talked about some of the general characteristics of uh, bureaucracy in comparative politics and this lecture will be both uh, a completion of that issue, the issue of bureaucracy in a comparative uh, political perspective and uh, a brief overview for the uh, uh, issue of the judiciary in comparative politics. Please know that the textbook and the cheek lecture notes are more systematic and more uh, uh, helpful in terms of the uh, digging deeper into this topic, so I recommend you look at them very closely and you study them and you prepare uh, accordingly for all your assignments and uh, let us uh, get rolling. Okay, we talked about comparative bureaucratic institutions, some of their responsibilities. We talked about uh, the first of two major theorists of bureaucracy. Uh, we talked about Max Weber and his guidelines in the previous lecture on, uh, for bureaucracy. We're going to turn to a second thinker. We're going to turn to Ludwig von Mises, uh, uh, M-I-S-E-S, who is Austrian uh, and has a very different theory of bureaucracy. Von Mises, in a famous book called uh, Bureaucracy, and by the way, von Mises was a contemporary, essentially, of Weber, uh, working at the same time uh, in cl relatively close proximity to each other, but coming to very different conclusions about how bureaucracy uh, should work. Where uh, Weber saw bureaucracy expanding, following a chain of command, a rigorous order of decision making, uh, and also suggesting that the growth of bureaucracy was inevitable and probably good, Von Mises, on the other hand, will argue that the best bureaucracy in a comparative political structure was the bureaucracy that was most efficient, the most cost effective. And uh, it is not a surprise to any of us that Von Mises would turn to efficient private organizations to be the model for public organizations. And his belief that the people who defend uh, governmental organizational bureaucracies as being distinct were inaccurate, that all bureaucracies had the same pathology, the same methodology, the same ways of operating. So von Mises would say that bureaucracy should be as efficient as possible, that uh, instead of a rigid chain of command where each check on the list is made to final approval of any idea, that in reality there can be diffused power, that certain groups can be given authority over certain areas, and they can then course report to uh, higher authorities but the power can be diffused. Also uh, decision making on a day-to-day -day basis can be uh, shared and that the sharing of responsibility letting the, the entity at the lowest level uh, make as many decisions as possible or reduce staff, make the organizations more uh, uh, responsible, uh, make the bureaucracies more responsible and make the bureaucracy itself more likely to respond to the needs of the citizens at whatever level uh, they are found. So this, this is a very important critique where uh, von Mises uses free market ideas, uh, ideas based upon government efficiency to guide bureaucracy, where uh, Weber looks at basic organizational structures. Having the right organization is the basis for a good bureaucracy, where von Mises, on the other hand, argues uh, very powerfully uh, that actually efficiency is more important uh, than structure, that cost savings is more important than structure, uh, making bureaucracy more responsible to uh, the citizens of a particular country is more important than uh, any other consideration. So two very different, yet two very uh, valid and important uh, critiques of bureaucracy. Okay, why does bureaucracy grow? Uh, 
Uh, that's a fundamental question we have to examine. And one of the reasons bureaucracy grows is that we have asked bureaucracy to do more. Bureaucracy has a larger and larger role in our lives. And so therefore, we have turned to bureaucracy, entitle bureaucracy, empower bureaucracy. Uh, and therefore, we need more and more bureaucrats, more and more agencies. Um, so uh, the growth of bureaucracy is a very important issue, um, especially uh, in developing nations where often the bureaucracy becomes the largest employer, perhaps, or controls large sectors of the economy. The notes also talk about some problems with bureaucracy, some issues with bureaucracy I would uh, direct your attention to, especially if those bureaucracies do not have what we call an SOP, standard operating procedures, uh, and they depend more on regional, perhaps regional bias, uh, or the bias of the executive, or the bias of the majority, the legislature. Uh, all these issues we talked about in other forms are explored more in, in the lecture notes. But basically, their uh, bureaucracy can make itself more efficient and uh, more uh, uh, supportive of the needs of the citizens. Okay. Let's shift gears. We've talked about uh, the legislature in a comparative perspective, the executive in a comparative perspective, bureaucracy, which really essentially falls under the executive in many ways in a comparative perspective. Now we're going to turn to the judiciary in a comparative perspective. Uh, certainly the American founders, including Alexander Hamilton, uh, thought that the judiciary would be uh, what Hamilton called the least important, at least dangerous to use his terms, the Federalist, the Federalist Papers. And so the judiciary in many ways is the least dangerous or least important, least important, but that's no longer the case. That has changed over time. And the uh, judiciary has become even more uh, important, not central, uh, to the operation of the life of, of a regime, whether it be a democratic, authoritarian, totalitarian, or some other variety, but still, the rise of the judiciary is one of the um, most important trends, I believe, and many scholars believe in comparative politics. Well, why is that the case? Um, it is the judiciary where issues that are not resolved between the president and the Congress, or the legislature, are confronted. By this I mean, for example, if there are issues or aspects of government where there is a serious dispute and they are not resolved, it's just the judiciary where these ideas turn. Uh, let's unpack that a little bit. Um, legal systems provide the basis for the political systems. Uh, and uh, judiciaries while they differ significantly, and it's difficult to make generalizations about the functions of judiciaries in a comparative perspective, we can still say that they perform an important and growing perspective. Uh, also, the judiciary, unlike the executive, unlike uh, the legislature, is not really part of the political process as much as the other branches. Now, in some countries, the judiciaries uh, are very, very politicized, but that's not necessarily the case, and they tend to be less so than uh, the other branches of government, sometimes even less so than the bureaucracy. That doesn't mean that the uh, judiciary is removed from political consideration. Well, uh, it is the role of the judiciary to engage in rule adjudication, to help solve issues that can't be solved any other way, of applying the rules of the government, of the Constitution, to uh, specific cases where the power of, a, of the government is invoked, used, or potentially misused. Uh, what are the major functions of the judiciary in comparative politics? Number one, conflict resolution. Inevitably, the, the branches and the elements of the country will be in some dispute. Uh, political parties will be in dispute within the legislature, with the executive, they may be in, in dispute with each other. Uh, there may be obligations the government has assumed, but it's not fulfilled. Uh, the judiciary will be where mo many of those issues are resolved or confronted, uh, often for the first time. Also, the issue of social control. 
a judicial authority is something that allows for questions that, uh, concerning citizens' preferences, and citizens' rights and liberties, that allows those issues to be resolved. And it's very important. And the judiciary is an institution where this can most easily take place because there is typically more confidence in the judiciary because it is removed from the political process much more than the other institutions of government that they might be able to resolve that issue. Um, thirdly, the judiciary legitimizes the regime, legitimizes the country. When the court resolves a disputed election, a disputed legislative decision, it gives it credibility that the other branches cannot. This actually has a very positive result for the country because it gives uh, the institution of the country more legitimacy, allows people to regain their confidence in the government, and then to be more active participants. Fourthly, and, fair, and I think very important, and this goes back to an old problem that uh, Plato realized and, uh, um, and wrote about uh, in many of the Platonic dialogues, including the Republic, is the tyranny of the majority. That the majority in a democratic system can often wield too much power if it is the actual majority over the minority. Even if that minority is 49% and the majority is 51, if they're not protections. Even if there are protections, there may be a need to protect minorities. Uh, while the president and the legislature respond to the majority, promote majority rule, uh, really exists because of a majority, it is the legislature that protects uh, uh, the constitutional provisions of the government and thereby protects, in many cases, minority populations and minority groups. Um, it's also become the legislature a means that minority groups can push their ideas forward. Now I'm talking about basically political minorities here. Uh, but these can also be other kind of minorities in a multicultural regime, some of which we're going to be talking about later in the course. Fifth, and certainly not the least important, is by its decisions, in many cases, a court can limit the power of the president and the executive by making policy itself, even though in most courts of any sort, they only can make decisions as a result of cases that have been appealed to them. They can't just go out and say, oh, well, I don't like this issue, or I like that issue, therefore I make a decision on this issue, or a decision on that issue. No, what happens in reality is they make public policy by saying, uh, or making a judgment about a specific issue. I'll give you a fairly recent U.S. model of how this took place. In American elections, uh, in American society a quarter century ago, uh, there was a strong push for term limits for members of the legislature. The people have been in Congress too long, they spent a career in Congress, they need to go back to the founders' ideas of the citizen lawmaker, and the idea was basically 12 years in the House, 12 years in the Senate. There's a term limit, then you could not be reelected. That's two Senate terms, or of course, six House terms. Well, that went all the way to the Supreme Court. It was essentially passed, it was, uh, uh, and it went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court turned it down, said it was not in accord with certain provisions of the Constitution. Therefore, we don't have term limits in American politics. But this can happen in thousands of different ways in many, many countries. Um, so the, the court serves some very, very important roles. In the lecture notes, we talk about types of law. We talk about approaches to the law. And these are very important, but they're better perhaps read and, and, uh, and understood in, in light of the lecture notes. The uh, remainder uh, of the lecture notes talks about different kinds of law and how they affect comparative politics. I would encourage you to study that very closely, to analyze that on your own, and uh, continue to study diligently and make progress. And uh, thank you for sharing this time with me.